Good morning and good afternoon to all of you and a warm welcome to this official scientific press conference of the International Liver Congress 2021. I'm Tobias Butler and I'm a member of the scientific committee at the European Association for the Study of Liver Disease, otherwise known as EASL. And EASL is of course the uh, convener of the International Liver Congress. Yesterday's opening press conference on the intersection between COVID-19 and liver disease really helped set the stage for the coming days ahead of us. A good deal of the research that was talked about yesterday described the impact that COVID-19 had on liver disease and hepatology in general. And to start off today, we'll continue that theme with an interesting study looking at how the pandemic has affected efforts to defeat hepatitis C in the United States. But we'll also then move on to preview some exciting new research around hepatitis B, hepatitis D or hepatitis delta, liver cancer and liver failure that we'll see presented this week. Before introducing my esteemed guest sitting here with me today, let me run through some housekeeping. This live press conference is being recorded and will be available on the EASL YouTube page shortly after it has ended. Embargoes on all the studies presented here today in this press conference have now lifted. Today we will be hearing brief remarks from all our speakers, then I will open it up for questions from our media representatives attending today. I'd ask all our journalists sitting in today to please mute themselves. To ask a question, please send it via the chat box and indicate your media outlet and who you would like to direct the question to. We will then direct the question to the nominated panelist. If you, if you wanna ask a question verbally, please indicate that with a raised hand, that too, so we can turn on your microphone. Please keep your questions brief and let's begin. Our first speaker is uh, Sarah Blach, HCV group leader at the CDA Foundation in the United States. And Sarah will run us through a fascinating modeling study looking at the impact of COVID-19 on the targets for eliminating hepatitis C in the United States. Sarah, please go ahead. Thank you so much. Um, as mentioned, my name is Sarah Block and I'm hepatitis C team lead. And I'm excited to discuss the results of our abstract, which is titled Modeling HCV Elimination Recovery Following the COVID-19 Pandemic in the United States and pathways to regain progress. Now, before we discuss the results of our analysis, I'd like to provide some background. As of 2019, before the COVID-19 pandemic, the United States was not on track to eliminate hepatitis C, and that was either per the WHO targets or per the CDC's National Progress Report on Viral Hepatitis. And this was really driven by two things, a continued increase in incident infections, but also ongoing treatment restrictions on the basis of fibrosis stage or sobriety. Now, as we're all aware, the COVID-19 pandemic further disrupted healthcare services, including services in the United States and services for hepatitis C. However, as of June of 2021, more than 63% of adults in the United States have received at least their first dose of vaccine. And so the healthcare sector is starting to return focus to other disease areas. So with that in mind, our goal for this analysis was to evaluate possible best case and worst case scenarios for hepatitis elimination in the years that follow the COVID-19 pandemic. Now to do this, we updated a previously validated Markov model with epidemiological data for the United States. And then we developed three scenarios, which would essentially bookend the possible outcomes for elimination recovery following the pandemic. The first scenario that we looked at was essentially what happens if hepatitis C programs never recover from the pandemic? What happens if treatment diagnosis efforts continue to decline into the future? The second scenario we looked at was what if we are able to recover our efforts and return to our previous treatment forecasts? And then the final scenario looked at what happens if we actually increase momentum in the wake of the pandemic and ultimately work towards achieving hepatitis elimination in the United States. <clears throat> now, what we found was that since 2014, uh, when the high SVR therapies were first launched in the United States, about 1.2 million people have been initiated on treatment for hepatitis C. The annual number of patients tre treated peaked in 2015, but it has been coming down ever since. Now, using this information in the model, um, we, we actually found that uh, as of 2019, there had already been substantial reductions in hepatitis prevalence, liver-related deaths, and HCC cases. Um, however, as mentioned earlier, the United States was not on track for elimination. Now, previously, we expected that about 160 or 170,000 patients would be initiated on treatment each year after 2019. 
But in reality, what we saw was that fewer than 150,000 patients actually started treatment. So it's about a 25% decline from 2019. Now, if HCV programs continue to experience long-term disruptions if the number of patients treated and diagnosed each year continues to decline through 2030 and, and after this year, we would actually expect that the total number of infections in 2030 would be higher than it is today. And this is mostly just due to ongoing transmission if we're not able to maintain treatment and those other interventions. Now, if however, hepatitis C programs rebound over the next few years and the pandemic is only a one or two year blip on the radar, then we would still not achieve the WHO targets or the, the CDC's targets by 2030, but we could avert more than 19,000 liver-related deaths relative to the previous scenario where we were essentially losing track of, of all hepatitis progress. And then the third scenario is really if the hepatitis community rallies and tries to work to increase momentum towards achieving the elimination targets in the United States. And doing this, we could actually avert more than 33,000 deaths and almost 25,000 liver cancers relative to that first scenario. So to conclude, the United States has made significant strides <clears throat> towards hepatitis elimination, although they're not on track for elimination, but these could also be easily lost in the wake of the pandemic if we become complacent. Elimination for hepatitis C is uncertain, and we really can't afford to take our past gains for granted, and, and losing track of that progress is really going to, to send us in the wrong direction. And ultimately, whether or not the United States achieves elimination is up to each and every one of us in the hepatitis community to decide. Now there's some good news. Um, there is political will for hepatitis screening and diagnosis in the United States uh, with recommendations from CDC and the USPSTF for screening of all adults, but it's yet to see how that'll be implemented. But really to achieve elimination, we need to make sure that all of those patients are not only uh, diagnosed, but then linked to treatment and care and cure their infections. This includes removing restrictions and also making sure we have equity across services. Thank you so much. Thank you, Sarah. Um, as most of you know, a cure for chronic hepatitis B has become the holy grail for a growing number of scientists looking at HPV cure. And hepatitis B is a bloodborne virus that uh, packs a punch. Worldwide, more than 1 billion people have been infected with hepatitis B, and 250 million people have developed lifelong or chronic infection. Globally, transmission most commonly occurs from mother to baby or in early life, but it's possible to be infected in adulthood through sex or blood to blood contact. Hepatitis B causes almost 40% of all liver cancers, which is the fifth most common cancer and the second leading cause of cancer related deaths worldwide. While there's a vaccine for hepatitis B, which infants receive, global coverage is only about 43% and 1 million people are still being infected every year. Most children infected early on will develop chronic hepatitis B, which hasn't been cured so far, in part because current therapies have failed to destroy the viral reservoir where the virus hides in cells within the liver. This is in contrast, of course, to hepatitis C virus, which has no such viral reservoir and can now be cured with as little as 12 weeks of treatment. So we are delighted to have with us today Ed Gain to talk us through some new advances in hepatitis B cure work. Ed is professor of medicine at the University of Auckland in New Zealand, and we are incredibly grateful for him for staying up so late for us. Over to you, Ed. Thanks, Tobias. Uh, so, so at this meeting, I pre I'm presenting data on a uh, longer follow-up data on uh, the safety and efficacy of a new class of drug, siRNA. It's VIR2218. Uh, and this is a drug which knocks down the messenger RNA uh, from the virus and therefore uh, potentially knocks down all the viral proteins. Uh, this uh, is a, a proof of concept phase one study. Uh, and as I said, it's further follow up to some preliminary data presented at this meeting last year. Uh, it's a new type of uh, siRNA. It's been modified by uh, uh, a chemical process called advanced stabilization chemistry. <clears throat> and by doing so, it allows the, uh, the target drug to uh, be more specific for the viral proteins and prevent any off-target effects on the host or the patient's proteins or any uh, non-specific protein binding. And certainly the preclinical data would support this 
uh, increased uh, safety compared to the older uh, generations of siRNAs. Uh, this does uh, target a, a single trigger in the viral genome called the X gene, and this allows a single uh, trigger to knock down all the viral proteins uh, with a single um, uh, siRNA. Uh, this is a, a very early study, so patients with chronic hepatitis B, and these were all suppressed on long-term nuke therapy. They received two doses, uh, varying from 20 up to 200 milligrams, so two doses a month apart. Uh, and this uh, showed that the, the drugs are very safe. Uh, important to note there are uh, no uh, significant ALT elevations uh, seen uh, throughout the treatment period, which was a month, and throughout the uh, 12 months of follow-up. So it appears to be a very safe uh, treatment to give. But in terms of uh, effectiveness or antiviral uh, efficacy, uh, this had very much a dose-related effect on um, surface antigen. Uh, surface antigen is, I guess, the marker we use when we look at the potential for hepatitis B functional cure. We'd like to see surface antigen become negative and remain negative long-term uh, after therapy is stopped. Uh, in this uh, trial, uh, the, the, as I said, there was a dose-related effect. Uh, you got a one log reduction with the lowest dose of 20 milligrams up to 1.8 logs uh, with the highest dose of 200 milligrams, two doses. Uh, and in addition to uh, suppressing surface antigen, uh, as expected from uh, the understanding of the trigger or uh, the other markers of uh, the hepatitis B virus were also reduced, such as RNA uh, uh, and uh, co correlated antigen. Uh, the uh, longer-term follow-up of, of this, uh, this um, meeting showed that the reductions in surface antigen were actually maintained for many months after uh, treatment was stopped. So you did appear to have a, a prolonged uh, effect. And we think this probably reflects in, in part the, uh, the chemistry of siRNAs how they're taken up by the liver. Uh, they remain in a pretty stable state uh, within, the, within the liver cell, within the what we call the risk complex, which is where they work uh, to knock down the viral, uh, the viral RNA. So, so there is a, uh, a means of uh, handling within the liver cell, which maintains uh, the ongoing effect of the drug uh, for many weeks and months after it is taken. Uh, and I, an important observation from this study was that the higher the dose uh, given, the longer the, uh, the knockdown effect on surface antigen. And we saw sustained responses, and these were people who had, uh, uh, even a year after their last dose of treatment, had a reduction in surface antigen of at least one log uh, below baseline. And that was seen uh, in... Uh, the higher the dose, the more likely that was to happen. But slowly, you did get some rebound with longer-term follow-up. So, so this is really as preliminary data. Only two doses were given. And we know that going forward uh, into phase two, uh, when we're looking at a functional cure, we'll be giving repeated dosing. And we will be giving it in combination with other uh, uh, nodal ther therapies. But th certainly, these results showed that uh, VIR2218 uh, did uh, get full target engagement and did knock down all the hepatitis B uh, viral markers, including E antigen, RNA, and correlated antigen. And uh, certainly this also supports that the effects were the same in the E antigen positive and E antigen negative patients. And why that is important is that that uh, really confirms that BIR2218 silences uh, the viral messengers, both from the uh, CCCDNA uh, template and also from the integrated uh, viral uh, DNA, which sits in the patient's own DNA. Uh, so so the, these were very encouraging data, very, very safe, uh, certainly uh, uh, very effective, and we will wait to see what the uh, phase two studies show in combination with other drugs. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much, Ed. And uh, now moving from HPV mono-infection to HPV-HDV co-infection. Our next speaker is Heiner Wiedemeyer. 
Heiner is professor and chairman of the Department of Clinic uh, uh, for Gastroenterology, Hepatology and Endocrinology at the Hannover Medical School uh, in Germany. Heiner will talk to some interim results from a phase three trial he's conducting with the drug Bulevirtid for patients with chronic hepatitis delta or hepatitis D. It's a little talked about member of the hepatitis family, but the one that is most difficult to treat and is associated with a high risk of rapid disease progression. Heiner has really spearheaded the efforts to introduce this drug into clinical practice, and we're really looking forward to your presentation, Heiner. Thank you very much, uh, Tobias, for the kind introduction. And as Tobias mentioned, I have to congratulate Isel that they selected uh, this uh, paper for, to discuss here because we are talking really about a very severe liver disease. For those of you who do not know the hepatitis virus alphabet, just to remind you, as Ed Gain just mentioned, B stands for being back because it's really very interesting, C for curable, E for emerging, but D stands for devil. It's the most severe form of viral hepatitis causing um, uh, a high risk to develop liver cancer and cirrhosis. And therefore, um, it was, if this is such severe, what can we do as physicians? Uh, for many years, we only used pegylated interferon, which helped roughly one quarter to one third of patients. Um, but I had the privilege to present uh, data on an alternative treatment concept, and that is HPV HDV entry inhibition. And bulivertide is a peptide, a concept that was developed by Stefan Urban from the University of Heidelberg. It's a peptide derived from the hepatitis B surface antigen, slightly modified, and uh, which you can inject to patients. And then this peptide is blocking the HPV HDV receptor, which is NTCP bile sort transporter. We could show in previous trials, phase two trials, that if you inject this peptide on a daily basis with different doses, that indeed you protect the yet uninfected hepatocytes and HDV RNA is declining linearly over time. And uh, the results were very promising in these phase two trials. And therefore the European Medical Agency granted conditional approval of this compound last August that we can now treat uh, patients in a real world setting already. In parallel, the company had to initiate the pivotal phase three trial. Um, and this is uh, ongoing here. And this is the paper that I am presenting. So this trial is presenting the first 24 weeks interim result data of this pivotal phase three trial, which is comparing patients receiving bulivertide two milligram daily injections versus high dose 10 milligram daily injections versus untreated patients. So these untreated patients after one year will be switched to 10 milligrams and the other two groups will be continued for another two years. So in the end, we are comparing two versus 10 milligram and two versus three years of viral treatment. So what were the findings? We had 150 patients randomized with these three arms. And the important message is that the findings of the phase two trials were basically exactly confirmed. So we saw a viral decline in most patients and um, overall in the two arms receiving active bulivertide, either 55 or 68% of the patients achieved at least a two lock HDV RNA decline and roughly half of the patients also normalized ALT levels. I think this is very important. Also the safety of the compound was confirmed. There was basically no major safety signal in this trial as to be expected bile assets increase because the mode of action is a blocking of a bile salt transporter and therefore bile salts increased also in these patients but there were no unexpected serious con um, uh, adverse events. So the message of this trial is safety and efficacy confirmed. Um, however, this was only 24 weeks interim data only a very small number of patients actually had completely undetectable HDV RNA. There was no effect on HPS antigen, so the envelope um, levels 
100% in line with the previous phase two trials. So um, this confirms that we can use the drug in real world. We have to wait now for the uh, next presentations when then the analysis of the one year data uh, will be performed. So exciting times for Delta patients, a new treatment option and safety and efficacy confirmed. Thanks a lot, Heine. And I'd now like to introduce uh, Li Zhu, Director of the Department of Liver Surgery at the Sun Yat-sen University Cancer Center in China. Our thanks for Li Zhu for staying up so late as well. Li Zhu will talk about some fascinating research involving chemotherapy combined with PD-1 or checkpoint inhibitors to treat liver cancer. We're looking forward to your presentation. Over to you, Li Zhu. Hi, everyone. It's my great honor to be invited by ESO and share our work here. Uh, our work is about the treatment of advanced HCC. You know, there are over 20,000 advanced HCC diagnosed every year in China. And the treatment strategy for advanced HCC differ uh, between the West and the East. Chinese opinion is more aggressive and uh, we do some uh, surgical resection in advanced HCC without uh, extra hepatic metastasis. But in these patients, uh, the post-operative relapse um, is a big problem. So um, after the emerge of PD-1 antibodies, we know it uh, caused um, very durable, uh, durable response. So we used a uh, four fox hike, that's a, a kind of uh, chemotherapy through a hepatic arterial infusion. And the combination with a PD-1 antibody, singlimab, to, to treat the advanced HCC. So we started the, uh, this phase two trial two years ago and enrolled 40 newly diagnosed HCC. All of them had vascular invasion, but no extrahepatic metastasis. All tumor lesions lo uh, localized in semi-liver and the patient will be treated with the combination therapy with Fofox hike and the PD-1 antibody and, uh, for each three uh, weeks. And after two cycles, we will uh, assess them again. And if the patient had shrinkage tumor, we will do the surgery. So of the 30 patients who received combination therapy, 21 of them were successfully conversed for surgery, 19 for surgical resection and two for RFA. And three of them get um, pathological complete response. So uh, there's chance for this advanced HCC to be cured. The primary endpoint PFS was 15.7 months and 12, 12 months PFS rate of 57.9%. That's almost equal to outcomes of patients with early and middle stage of HCC. So to in, uh, conclude, Fofox hike in combination with Sintelimab uh, is a safe and successful conversion therapy, providing uh, outstanding PFS to advanced HCC. And um, although the, uh, our results is um, almost in the HBV related HCC, uh, we, we highly recommend the investigators in other countries to um, do some trials about this new strategy and um, maybe more and more patients could uh, with advanced HCC could be cured. Thank you very much. Thank you, Li Zhu. We're now uh, moving from one complication of advanced liver disease, uh, hepatocellular carcinoma, to another one, acute on chronic liver failure. And our final speaker today is Banvari Agarwal. Banvari is a consultant in critical care medicine at the Royal Free Hospital in the United Kingdom. 
And he will describe some promising early results on the safety and the efficacy and performance of the Dialife liver dialysis device in patients with acute on chronic liver failure. We're looking forward to your presentation. Bambari, go ahead. Uh, thank you, Tobias. So just to uh, say a few things uh, first about the burden of the, uh, this liver disease, this acute on chronic liver failure. We know cirrhosis, uh, it affects uh, uh, hundreds of thousands of people uh, in the world. And these patients, uh, they come into hospital with acute flare up of the disease, that is acute decompensation. And some of these patients, they then go on to progress to other organ failure. And the short term outcome for these patients is abysmal. Uh, with the current standard of care. Uh, Darlive is a, a, a novel device. It's a mechanical uh, liver device, uh, which does two things to these patients, uh, which uh, hits uh, at the heart of, of, we believe, two of the most important pathobiological mechanisms uh, which drive this syndrome and which drives uh, further organ failure in these patients. Uh, one being that in these patients, so that is in cirrhotics and more so in those with acute decompensation and even more in those who progress to other organ failures, uh, we have seen our preliminary data has shown that the albumin, which is made by the liver is uh, uh, not only uh, quantitatively, uh, quantitatively uh, lower but it, it loses a lot of its functionality, its binding capacity, detoxification efficiency. So unlike previous uh, trials on artificial liver devices, uh, i.e. Mars and Prometheus, where uh, albumin detoxification was carried out through a, a dialysis system, uh, but the albumin then was recirculated. What do we set out to do is that these, uh, uh, these uh, albumin uh, uh, molecule, which are largely pro-inflammatory, mainly because of the oxidative injury, uh, they, uh, they actually uh, act as pro-inflammatory species. So we just want to remove them completely and discard it and then infuse fresh albumin into the patient. And uh, the other hypothesis really is that uh, uh, the majority of organ failure in this condition uh, is uh, predicated on an ongoing intense systemic inflammatory syndrome. Uh, the other filter used in this device is uh, called Oxiris, which mops up, uh, if like, all the circulating endotoxin. The net result being that, uh, that the system uh, it uh, leads to a significant attenuation, if you like, of systemic inflammation, and that has a direct impact, uh, A, in, if you like, liver regeneration, and B, recovery of liver and other organ failure. Uh, this is a, a mainly a safety study, but we also looked at uh, the performance of the device. Uh, which means we just wanted to see what the device does to the patient and safety, that is what, how patients react to this device. Uh, I'm very glad to report that the overall safety data from this uh, have been quite promising uh, with serious adverse events uh, were uh, very similar in the two arms. Uh, and the performance and uh, uh, what it translated uh, if like in the clinical outcomes uh, were uh, fascinating and fantastic. So what we saw that uh, uh, of uh, the patients treated with DALA, two thirds of them, they achieved complete resolution of what we call ACLF, that is restoration, restoration to their baseline, if like uh, liver illness, and there was a significant improvement in other extra hepatic or non-liver organ function, uh, particularly the brain function, uh, which is assessed uh, on the ba basis of uh, liver encephalopathy. 
Uh, and this uh, resolution of ACL then translated into ongoing improvement as well as survival at 28 days. Uh, it, it, the, the, these were the main findings and uh, I'm really happy to take uh, questions on any of the, you know, any, any specific elements uh, of these uh, uh, findings. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much, uh, Banvari. And now we'll be happy to take your questions. And again, to ask questions, please send it via the chat function and indicate your media outlet and who you would like to direct the question to. Um, and we will then direct the question to the nominated panelists. Um, and again, if you want to ask verbally, please indicate that with a raised hand and we can turn on your microphone and please keep your questions brief. Let's begin. So the first question that we have is for um, Ed Gain, and it's from Ingo van Thiel from the German Liberate. Aid. Um, and let me see, this has already been answered in the chat, right? Yeah. yeah. But should we still discuss it? Yep. Let's yes. just do it, right? So the question is, if novel uh, siRNA drugs knock down all parts of HPV, why then aim for functional cure and not try to go one step further with sterilizing cure? I think small steps. Uh, I think functional cure uh, will achieve our, our aim in terms of uh, a finite course of treatment with uh, uh, prolonged off-treatment uh, loss of surface antigen and HPV DNA, which means no viral replication, uh, no active liver disease. Uh, but that, that doesn't mean uh, clearance of uh, CCC DNA, uh, which I guess is so-called complete cure, or removal of integrated DNA sequences in the host genome, which is sterilizing cure. And, and no doubt they would be the ultimate goals because they would um, uh, presumably significantly reduce the lifetime risk of developing liver cancer. Uh, but uh, I, I think we, we're, you know, we're in the early days, I think, of, of, of uh, looking at uh, finite therapy. Um, and I do think if we can achieve functional cure, uh, there will be uh, uh, certainly a reduction in, in uh, CCC DNA activity and, and potentially, uh, depending on what drugs are combined and how effective they are, we, we may see uh, clearance of uh, hepatitis B infected cells or surface antigen uh, uh, producing cells, but we just don't know um, whether that will have a, a long-term effect and uh, in terms of CCC DNA uh, uh, elimination. Uh, I think uh, if, uh, your, your question about sterilizing cure, I think that's in the future. Uh, whether we will be able to uh, achieve that with the current drugs in, uh, currently in development, uh, or whether we'll need to wait for uh, gene editing uh, uh, technology uh, to become efficient for this disease, uh, I, I can't answer that. But I think functional cure is uh, our goal uh, now and for the foreseeable future. I hope that answered the question. And, um, and if I uh, may add to this, uh, Ed, uh, I'm not sure you would agree, um, but if you have a patient that has received functional cure based on the current biomarkers that we have, we really would not be able to differentiate whether the patient has actually achieved functional cure or sterilizing cure, right? We're just missing the biomarkers for that. Yes, that's correct, that's correct. All right, so the next question um, would also be for um, um, Professor Agaval Banvari. Uh, are there plans to compare Dialife with other liver dialysis devices such as MARS in head-to-head -head studies? So Tobias, I've already uh, uh, typed uh, an answer, but just to reiterate that uh, uh, two of the most widely used, uh, if you like, mechanical artificial liver devices, that is, Mars and Prometheus have, uh, have actually failed in randomized clinical trials in patients with uh, acute or chronic liver failure. And uh, uh, I would refer to those two trials, uh, which are very well known, the Weifel trial and Helios. Uh, so there, there, there seems a little point uh, in then comparing 
uh, something uh, which is uh, currently evolving. We still haven't got data from efficacy trial, uh, but comparing uh, with something which did not really uh, have much benefit. Uh, and these trials uh, don't come cheap. Comparing you know, different devices is astronomical uh, amount of uh, money. So uh, that, that would only be done or maybe considered if uh, there was a, a similar story with all of these devices, then maybe one-to-one -one comparison uh, would inform uh, a choice, uh, if, if like for the clinicians, which one to choose. Hope that answers the question. Thank you, Banvari. Let's move to the next question then. Um, that's again from uh, Ingo Fantil from the German Liver Aid, and this one goes to uh, Professor Heiner Wiedemeyer. Uh, I understand the data are only prelim preliminary in phase three. Based on the phase two data and the current clinical experience, can we already predict, one, how long Bulliver T patients will have to be treated in real life, and two, if the aim is control with minimal HDV uh, DNA or even cure with permanent HDV DNA clearance? So, so the short answer to both questions is I don't know. This is the, the, the short answer. Uh, let's say uh, how long we really have to treat patients. I think we will have in the end personalized. I consider three different scenarios. There may be patients where we go for, for long-term treatment, in particular patients with advanced cirrhosis where you don't want to take any risk in case of relapse. The second group, maybe where indeed finite treatment is possible. Some modeling suggests that after two to three years, uh, we may get rid of almost all HDV infected cells, but that is only modeling. And therefore, uh, this trial will answer this two to three years. I think it's a good guess, but not more. And the third scenario I consider uh, exploring also based on phase two trials, combinations with pegylated interferon. And then to see here uh, whether we may induce here some S antigen losses, and that certainly would be final therapy for 24, for 48 weeks. That's a question, and we and basically this includes already the HDV RNA question. Uh, let's say the, the ideal goal would be cure, but I consider this very hard in Delta. We have seen late relapses after interferon based therapy, even after seven years now, um, and therefore. I think uh, control of HDV RNA on a very, very low level is to me the, let's say, goal, which is realistic. Thank you, Heine. And you've already clarified that it's actually HDV RNA that we're looking at. Okay, thank you for this. And so the next question is from, um, let me see from, uh, Ed Susman from MedPage today, uh, it's for me. Can you put in perspective the encouraging reports on treatment of Hep D and on chemo plus checkpoint inhibitors for treatment of advanced HCC? What steps remain before these treatments can be recommended for patients and how, hopefully, how hopeful are these treatments? Well, I think for hepatitis delta and uh, uh, Bulliver T treatment, that answer is pretty easy. There's really not much uh, uh, um, to, to, to add to what Heine has already said. If, we have the, uh, the, the drug and it's approved. It's really the best that we have. So, so there's, uh, we, we need more data on uh, how long to treat. We might need combination therapies in the future, all these things, um, but uh, uh, we're really in a desperate situation when we're looking at treatment of patients with hepatitis delta with active disease. So um, I would say, uh, what are we waiting for? The, the drug is there, use it. Um, and uh, it, it's, uh, it's really beneficial for the patient. And with regards to the HCC study, well, it's also uh, um, depending on, uh, on um, the, the, the approval in the different countries, but uh, um, checkpoint therapy should be first line treatment in uh, um, uh, systemic therapy. You know, there's a combination of uh, acetolizumab and vivacizumab, and that's Show, been shown to be the best um, systemic treatment for HCC. So this is also something that is part of clinical practice. And whether we combine this with other uh, therapies and the, the, uh, the study from Lizu is very elegant in this regard. 
So um, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm very hopeful that uh, we'll be able to combine several of these treatments in the future. So um, uh, I hope this answered uh, your question. Um, another question for me, could you please comment on the potential for liver dialysis systems and how dial life differs from other system? This question comes from Neil Osterweil. Uh, well, this is uh, pretty much answered already by Banvari, I would suggest. Um, again, here, uh, uh, it's very early, but we're really desperate in finding something to um, uh, bridge to transplantation. And uh, jump in, please, Banvari, if you want to add something. But uh, I think this is very hopeful, right? I missed the questions. Uh, can you repeat that, Tobias? I couldn't read yeah. it there. The question is, could you comment on the potential for liver dialysis systems and how dial life differs from other systems? And I said, you've already answered parts of it. it yes, most of it really. As I said, the previous systems, uh, uh, the, the recirculated albumin, if you like, and uh, uh, we now know more that uh, uh, the albumin, the native albumin in these uh, conditions uh, that itself is uh, uh, damaged, so is uh, irreversibly oxidized, and is uh, is functionality in terms of binding and detoxification efficiency uh, is is very very poor. So so removing that potentially uh, improves so overall if like the inflammatory milieu of the patient and the the whole idea therefore with Darlive is. Uh, uh, not just achieving a mechanical reduction in some of these uh, biochemical markers like uh, uh, previous uh, uh, you know, generation of devices we're doing like reduction in bilirubin, et cetera. What we are proposing that by dampening the systemic inflammation, uh, what uh, uh, the device uh, potentially does is uh, give that all important nudge uh, to if you like, restore a more friendly and less hostile environment uh, for the body uh, such that uh, the, the, the liver can regenerate and the overall process, uh, then it uh, aids uh, natural recovery. Uh, that's where I think uh, is Dialive is different. Uh, there's one other thing that uh, uh, Dialive uses, you know, equipments that uh, we normally use in ICU. So uh, uh, the ease of use, we just take uh, uh, advantage of uh, uh, equipments currently already available in the uh, ICUs. We just need the filters, mount them on those machines and stick it uh, on the patient and, uh, and see it work. Thank you. All right. So yeah, thank you very much. And I think we're approaching our time limit and that's all the time we have. If uh, there are any pressing questions, please approach um, Michael Kessler from ILC comms team if you wanna follow up with any of our speakers. And uh, with this, I would again like to thank uh, all of our experts, authors and, and speakers at this conference for being with us, for staying up late. Um, uh, and uh, I wish all of you a good rest of the Congress and uh, goodbye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye -bye. Good night. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Bye -bye. Bye -bye.